All righty, guys. Welcome back. We are here with episode three of the BJJ and Business Martial Arts Marketing Podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest, Samuel Braga from mm-hmm. Braga Jiu Jitsu in Knoxville, yes. Tennessee. And I'm going to say, edit, guys, put in the clapping noises. We'll be like, yeah. Thank you. So, man, thank you again so much for, for joining us here. Um, you know, our, our job is our goal is to like give people value about jiu-jitsu and martial arts and just talk about the industry and what it's like being like an academy owner. Um, but man, so tell me about yourself. How did you get started? Give me a little background information and, and kind of how you got uh, into teaching jiu-jitsu. All right. So um, like uh, anybody at the early t- 2000s, um, I got influenced by a lot of the Grace family, you know, that's what brought me into the sport. When did you start Jiu-Jitsu? What, what year was it? Uh, 2000. 2000. Okay. I like to think I started in the winter of 99, but it oh, was about nice. the same yeah, time. Before I did. Yes. It, was like, awesome. I, I, it may have been 2000. I remember it, and I tell people it's like, because it was like the songs that were on the radio, you know, it was like the well, 99 is a, the music are amazing, you know, the pop culture is much better oh, bro. Today, you know. Bro, the Dr. Dre's like 2000 came out. Was you that? Know, yeah. have so many good hits, you know, from rap because it was like a different type of rap that we have today. Yeah. From like uh, the rock, you know, you have like the time, uh, what's the name? Um, uh, Offspring, you have like uh, Mush- Smashing Pumpkins, you have yeah, like, Smashing uh, Pumpkins, yeah. I'm from you Seattle, have, so it was like Oasis, the was the you thing, have all you know? kinds of different music, they're like so great for their lyrics, you know, not only just the beat itself, you know. And you remember because like the way your brain works is like i don't know but i remember that song right i remember this yeah song yeah yeah doing, connects you know i think the music is really good because connects you the time yeah like, yeah it's just more like yeah. Yeah, i feel like sometimes it's like it's a joke you feel like it's like almost a time machine you know yeah you oh man bring back in time, literally right? literally you, the same feelings that you experienced from that song yeah oh, i remember i was there and i was feeling some type of way the nostalgia right yeah right so you started in 2000 what did, what did that look like for you well, it was great. You know, like, was, was that? Brazil? Can you repeat, please? Oh, I say, are you from Brazil? Yeah, I'm from Brazil in Belo Horizonte. You know, I started. Oh, with Belo Horizonte. Track- okay. Yeah, I started with Eric Vanderlei at first, and then I uh, want to intensify my train, add to my trainings, because I was mm-hmm. like, I, and right at the beginning, I knew what I wanted. I had a goal in mind, which was mm-hmm. like basically become a world champion. Yeah. So with that goal in mind, I knew that I have to put more time on the mats. The more mm-hmm. time I I put on the mats, I knew increase my chance to become a world champion mm. so i start planning around that and um so i had i train in the evening with eric van der Lee, which is a drug cleaning student mm-hmm. and then trying to drug cleaning on uh, morning and afternoons mm-hmm. and um which is you know just made me a better athlete and better um technician overall right yeah, so, you were training every day, like every day. Yeah, I I never, I mean, even when I was injured, or sick, I did not take a break. I mean, mm-hmm. I had a commitment, no, I had mm-hmm. to to train no matter what, because I, I mean, I just love the sport, you know. Yeah. It was challenging to me, and I think any, I'm kind of have a, a personality. When I'm learning something, I have extremely obsessive about it. Yeah, so, I feel like you do that to people. I huh? feel like you just do especially most people really. The, oh, bro. I'm all I'm all jujitsu in. How how old were you at the time? If you don't uh, the time it was like 17 at the time. Oh, okay. Let 16, 17. Like, it was not it's not too old. Yeah, not I feel like yet, in Brazil. Sure. I've huh? been there a couple of times. And it seems like, and this was like 2010, maybe. 2010, I think we went back to 2012, something like that. 11 ish And I feel it's just more serious there. You know what I mean? Here, yeah. here now in the 2024 people in the united states you know with all the trainings and this this and that maybe the same but like i just remember in brazil even just watching like some kids train like they weren't messing around yeah, like, i mean i feel like brazilians they i mean when i we came from like a, a eric van der you know i think if everybody had that in their compat they're so competitive overall right yeah and everybody had like not everybody the majority of people have uh, that goal of competing at some point yeah, to make people more serious about it. Like I like to say, like for example, at Eric Van der Lee or Drek Lino's school at the time, the amount of people that have enrolled, the amount of people now it will really really rare for somebody just enroll and not show up to class. Mm. But I think like in the United States, people are more chill about it, more relaxed. Yeah. So sometimes they come once, twice a week. Sometimes they don't show up that week. They come next week. But yeah. 
I think like in Brazil, because I don't know, of course, the culture, everybody wants yeah. to make the best of for the buck, you know? Yeah, yeah. They pay for the unlimited train. They can make sure they're going to be. Yeah. They don't want to waste that money, you know? It says so unlimited, I, so I'm going to be there unlimited times. Oh, yeah. They yeah. want to be like, I want to be there twice. I want to make my money worth, you know? Yeah. They no, want to no, make no. sure I'm, they make the best out of the time money. and the, yeah. the investment they're making at the gym, you know? And I okay. think that culture is so cool because you have – for example, they've been that the, this school in Brazil have a hundred students in row. You know that the time, for example, eleven a.m. and six p.m. You're gonna have those hundred people coming in. Yeah. That day, you know what I'm saying? I've seen some of these mats. I'm like, my God, like, what is? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I just saw one of my friend. I mean, friends there, there, in his gym in Brazil, and he, I know he has like around 150 in row, right? Mm. And and 150 people coming a day. Because they don't want to just waste that money, you know. Yeah. They want to make sure that they are making his, their money worth, you know. I think that's but what you want, people, right? Huh? I mean, ultimately, kind of like my next question, like, so what you started training in 2000, what did your journey look like from training, competing at 17, doing these things to now becoming like an academy owner? I opened my eyes a lot. I mean, as an instructor, I think I have a – I'll say that you have a view and a vision, right? Completely changed when you go through that period of like transformation, I'll say, from an mm. athlete to instructor, right? Yeah. And a gym owner. Um, when did that happen for you? Huh? When, did, when did you start making that transition? It was a hard transition for me because I always, I love competing and I love grinding yeah. on the mats. And for me to, to take a step back and become an instructor where I don't I'm focusing more on my students, I'm focusing more on their needs than my needs. It was like a long transition for me because I competed for a long period of time. Mm. And but still like um, you know, when you come when you train in Brazil, it was like so intense. I'm sure you've been in Brazil for competition mm. training. Yeah. It's such I, went to, I went to Allianz in yeah. Sao Paulo. Like so, and all the cool I mean, that's like, oh. a that's a state of competition right there. Like one of the best schools as far as mm. competition. You know how intense they are the train sessions, yeah. right? There's no playing around. There's no joke no around. No Everybody's jokes. there grinding no jokes, yeah. pretty hard. Every train, every row is like a you know, is a tournament, right? Yeah, I remember yeah. I saw like there was like this shit like ledge where Fabio yeah. Miguel would sit, and then he would have somebody come over, and I don't remember if they did like this so he could sit up on it or if they went on like his back. Where you could like step on their back to like get it was just like very like oh like he could have climbed up there but he's like no no guys here up there <laughs> up there professor I was like okay whatever you say general whatever you say <laughs> yeah no it's definitely a, a different vibe so like you came from that vibe and then like what made what made like you want to mindset make right I think that getting away from the mindset of competitor I think is um is a rich hard transition honestly yeah um, I really enjoy it because I enjoy that it's not like I, you know, I had to do it. Never had a, uh, I never had the feeling that I was obligated to do it. I just enjoyed every grinding day. Yeah. And I really had a lot of fun. So for me, getting away from that mindset, the, 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 the perspective of things of jujitsu, it become completely, because you, as an athlete, you're so selfish, you know? That's and what because, I was going to ask. I feel like to be an athlete, you have to be very selfish. Extremely yeah. selfish, you know? Yeah. And, and um and getting away from the mindset to become selfless right where you're watching the students you focus on the students your focus no longer about you is on the students and when you for example nowadays i roll but i don't roll as hard i yeah. roll more like you know it's completely different type of role right yeah. from when i was competing and that transition is really hard for an athlete yeah yeah you know um did you start teaching in Brazil or this is when, when did you come I here? I thought in Brazil, but it was just an excuse for me to be on a mat, honestly. Okay. Yeah. So I taught class and the class was really short so I can maximize my training. Mm. I felt like it's not necessarily more a teaching. Of course, I taught techniques and I make sure they're learning. I yeah. enjoyed that. But uh, my main focus was as an athlete, you know. Mm. Okay. And I think that, I think there's a difference there. Because you, I mean, as an instructor nowadays, I feel like it's so much different. You know, jujitsu involves so much yeah. where you're pouring to your students, right? You want to pour to your students. You want to give. I feel like that's why I tell my 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 friend here. He also helps me at the gym. Mm. 
mm. every time I go on a mat, I have to pour everything I have. So I yeah. like to, to have a little bit of break between classes mm. so I can give everything. To yeah. my students, you know, because if you get, you can't fill up anybody else's cup if your cup's empty. You know yeah, exactly. I mean? like, so you're like not giving the energy, you know, to them. Yeah. And it's like for me, that transition for me was like uh, uh, really hard, you know? Yeah. But I enjoy a lot now mm -hmm. because my goal shifted mm. when, when did you open up your academy when did huh? you when did you like move to the united states and, and open up your gym so i came here um you know computer first in 2007 in 2008 i i stayed here um i op not not open a gym I was working for somebody helped jerk green as well in his gym at his gym mm -hmm. then 2010 he's in I la right was he in la no he's in texas right Texas, in Houston, Texas. Is there a different Dracolina or is like a there's, huh? there's only one, right? There's the only one. one. There's only okay. one. The one he from was Ray okay. Yeah, he's okay. I mean so he was in Texas. There was another Vinicius Magalhães, yeah. There's two Vin Vinicius okay. Magalhães, which okay. is the MMA okay. fighter, Vinny Magalhães, the MMA fire that finds uh, over nine nine kilos. Yeah. And there's Vinicius Magalhães, the coach, Dirk Dracolino. Okay, okay, got it. There were two Vin Vinicius Magalhães. Yeah, the other one is uh Larange's arch rival Renato Larange's yeah, it's so rival. funny right they have a really good fighting rivalry this thing's hilarious so you started teaching for Dracolina in Texas how did you get to to Nashville or, I mean to, to Tennessee Knoxville. Um, Knoxville. so I got an offer so I was helping Dracolina there at his gym it was a pleasure to uh it was a great learning process that I had there yeah period and I learned a lot about running the gym mm -hmm. um of course, I'm always learning, right? Because you always yeah. learn and prove yourselves. But um, that was a really good learning experience, and I helped him there. And then I really want to two things, right? I want to be able to compete and be able to run a gym. That was my goal. So I got an offer, an offer to be here, to be teaching in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. But it was a good pay, and it was like more higher ranks, which allowed me to comp to train to compete. Yeah. So it was a great this is that somebody else's gym where they said well, hey open up a gym and be the instructor is somebody hired you to teach there yeah so a guy opened the gym here they hired me to 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 teach and then several that was a couple high rank belts you know not many but a, a, you know a handful two handfuls mm -hmm. at the time which is like helped me on my because i just had to teach right i didn't have to yeah run a business which make easier I just have to like sort of focus on my conditioning and training yeah. along the teaching what year was this uh 2008 2008 okay yes mm -hmm. 2008 uh probably like uh right summer of 2008 i'm just gonna say okay we summer yeah so Spring then you're summer. teaching there and then what happened yeah then i the guy that was, was the gym owner he had um you know, has family in Idaho and some stuff yeah. was going on. His family there, he had to leave and then he sold the gym to me. Uh, oh, could, okay. That's yeah. what's up. He sold you the gym. Okay. That's what's up. Okay. So yeah, it was a good this, transition. So you mm -hmm. own it since 2008? You've been running this? Dude, no, no, no. That was like late. I, I worked for him for almost two years, right? Okay. 2010 was the thing, the year that I, I purchased the gym. Oh, wow. Okay. That's yeah. what's up, man. That's what's yeah, up. Yeah, it was I, a blast. quit my job. In 2012 to do this gym full time so yeah this the, awesome. the dream and the nightmare all together i always tell people that yeah um so how's your academy like how many i, mean, I feel blessed you know i love i love what i do you know yeah. i don't feel like i'm working yeah. right so when you enjoy i come here at 5 a.m teach a class i have several classes throughout the day i enjoy in every single aspect i come you know I mean, give me a freedom to to ch to pick up my daughter, mm -hmm. take her to her activities, yeah. you know, to see my wife whenever. How I is, how I is your daughter? She's ten years old. Oh, nice. So I have a thirteen-year-old, really right? Soon to be two-year-old. So that's the thing of being being a gym owner. You know, give you the flexibility for yeah. you to you know uh, spend time with the family or do things related to them. And that's i think i'm extremely blessed you know okay like how many how many general students do you think you have like what's your load of like well, working i mean people? i think a little bit but um i'm close to 200 um okay nice. around the ballpark i mean 
you know but it's like uh you know how it is man you have students pausing all kinds of stuff you know yeah but like um i mean you feel feel blessed you know what I yeah do. it really is it really is i mean i know you mentioned this like before and it sounds like i mean from 17 to just like live that jiu-jitsu lifestyle like it seems like did you have any other jobs like in between that or were you just like this is all yeah i mean i always like to grind it you know like um what other uh, kind of work did you do while you were like i mean i've worked since i was 15 14 years old okay uh, i mean my dad because i was like um when i was 14 i was doing a lot of skateboarding my dad thought it was really not safe so yeah i don't think if you yeah, so, it, did you break your arm have you broken any no i never skateboard? broke my arm but it was like you know getting I feel like if you don't break crazy. your arm like you're not really skateboarding i don't know i never skateboard it's, it looks very dangerous if you think about it like, yeah it is you know yeah. and then it was my dad and my mom was getting concerned about it so we, i started working on this farm oh, my nice. dad knew what kind of stuff did you guys grow was that what type of stuff did you guys grow on the farm oh it was not a farm though i'm sorry it was i was working for uh, a company that's like a design company i'm a um, graphic design oh okay, okay. not a farm my dad had a farm but it's like i didn't do any work there yeah um no i didn't do it just... daughter loves old mcdonald's that's her favorite song yeah 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 it's okay. like uh was that oh no, no i was saying like so you had you had odd jobs like doing graphic design and stuff like that. I, I had some different jobs and then i mean my i had an under i have an undergrad in um industrial design oh wow yeah. okay it was completely different i want to do something that's like i didn't want to I a lot of my friends do like uh do everything related to fitness because of jujitsu you know yeah. and I chose to do something completely different I thought yeah. that I shot I should have like a, my mind work something different yeah um, yeah so everyone's different my knowledge you know yeah um I just so one minded one I'm are you teaching a lot of classes a day or like what, what would you yeah, say I do, I do enjoy teach teaching you know I could I could delegate to people but i enjoy the teaching yeah yeah i enjoy being in the mats because i mean i had opportunity to work in another field mm. and i did not do it due to the fact that i love to be in the mats yeah, so for me yeah. i think i'll be cheating not on anybody but cheating myself if i not do the job that i wanted yeah so yeah to be on the mats right so if i'm yeah. I, the gym the dream to have a gym is to have myself to train to be available to train and be on the mats all the time if i'm delegated to somebody not doing that job i feel like i'm cheating my old self you know yeah i mean totally i mean i think you know for me i, I come here i've kind of not taught as much i mean there were times it was like 10 classes a day kind of thing and then i realized you know what i i've i enjoy yeah. doing other things i enjoy having my free time and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's whatever people like. Some people's like, no, I'm here teaching class and that's what I love and that's what I like to do. And like, yeah, that's I mean, how we do this because we love to do this kind of stuff. You know? Exactly. So, so let me ask you, getting kind of in the business stuff, like what would you say is like your perfect client? Like what would you say, like when you're trying to get new students, what would you say is like the type of person that you're looking for? I think that there's no such perfect client because nobody's perfect. You know, we yeah. all got image. Yeah. Um, and and I think that the only perfect the person was perfect, you know, get to liberate religion, even though I might not want it at first, but no, no, go ahead, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, but what would you I say is your ideal? Ideal the, client would be a person that's here all the time, right? A person that's engaged, part mm -hmm. of the team. Uh, I like somebody that's on a mat. For me, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so for me the ideal client is somebody that's on a mat inspired and passionate about jiu-jitsu mm. because that's easier right somebody that loves jiu-jitsu they're here they're training they like to be here yeah. that for me is the, the ideal client there's you know? someone that's like just really bought in community yeah, person, the guys like... my core group of guy you know my guys that can hear and i know yeah. they're gonna be here that's yeah. my ideal client because you have a good connection because we're both passionate about jiu-jitsu yeah and their goals are to improve in jiu-jitsu that's for me my ideal client okay what would you say are like some of your biggest like wins like working with you get people will come in every day you know someone was dealing with something or whatever like what what can you say it's like oh man this guy came in i feel so great about the impact that this had on this person like yeah do you have any specific that, examples like 
the story sure, that guy. At any point in time that you can enhance somebody's life, for example, you get a kid that's completely shy and he has a hard time socializing. Yeah. And um and then they become super confident, right? Yeah. They're confident. I had a student that he had like problems communicating mm -hmm. and he had a problem, you know, to be part of the society per se, you know, because you're so shy, you yeah. not feel comfortable being around people, you're not gonna be comfortable doing kids' activities. Yeah. And then you start doing jujitsu and he felt so comfortable. He started playing soccer, playing football. Mm -hmm. So he became a whole different kid that he not even had time for jujitsu anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he's like, oh coach, I'm so sorry I don't have time because I have all these events that I, I go to. You know, I have to play I play soccer or play at the time he was playing football as well. Or he was have this events and gathering from his from friends and stuff. I was like, listen, my job is done. Yeah. Oh man. You know? So I mean, just imagine how his family probably feels. Yeah. If, if you know, imagine like, here talk, and then they feel really, they're really pleased. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the the unique things about like you know, uh, being in a like a service business, being in a, especially jujitsu in particular, because it's so it's so niche, it's so like. Kind of like a narrow scope of kind of things that you do that impact such a wide variety of, of other kind of things that you have in your life and to be in a space where you can like literally like imagine the good this guy's gonna do imagine yeah. what his life would have been like you know maybe it's drugs maybe it's some other people maybe it's other kind of stuff mom and dad like oh my boy right and then because yeah. of jujitsu and the work that you do like it's a whole nother thing and it's very i, I mean we do jujitsu I'm not saying it's unique to jujitsu, but I feel like it is. Jujitsu has a lot to do with it. Is what I'm trying to say. So yeah. Um, okay. So all right. I I kind of struggle with this. And I, I'm trying to get better at it. What would you say is like your your elevator pitch? Like when someone walks in, they say, "Hey," and I really don't like this question. Say, "What do you do?" Well, I do all kinds of things. Like when someone says, "Like, hey, Samuel, what do you do?" What What would you tell them? Like, how would you how would you describe your business? My business, I think, like. I had, so a, you had a party you haven't kept saying, oh, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, I mean, we had a different approach a while ago, was mainly big champions. Mm -hmm. And my approach today is a little bit different. I mean, I think that our approach today is impact our community in a positive way, mm -hmm. enhance people's lives, you know? Yeah. I believe that when you go to a competition side, you're going to narrow down to, like, not like Five people. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to, it's so narrow the niche that you have so small yeah. that in i mean some some people might have like more people competing but i think that impact the majority of people in a positive way it can enhance their life they can feel not only physically in better but mentally better yeah when okay. they come in and when they get out feel a completely different person that's that's our goal and that's i think that would be uh our main goal spread the passion of jiu-jitsu inspiring people and enhance their life. I mean, honestly, bro, I think if somebody told me that, I bet, like, bro, sign me up, bro. Where can I, where can I start? You know yeah. What I mean? Like so <laughs> much of like our ability to connect with people is kind of what our, our intention is, right? Yeah. Like if our intention is I'm gonna make you a world champion. Well, look, you take a hundred people, you're gonna have your top three percent, and that yeah. top three percent are the people that are gonna be on those podiums. You know what I mean? I mean, what? How many people are competing at blue belt lightweight in the worlds? Like what? 200 people in a bracket or something like that. So you're going to get 0.5% of that or point was it? 0.1% is going to win. 0.5%. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but a very, very small. Yeah. Hit, you know what I'm saying? So, okay. Um, so having the gym, like what, what is like your process for like getting new members? Like what is your, like somebody walks to the door, someone fills out a form or something. Like how do you. Yeah, the goal is like, uh, we, we try to, make sure that in my opinion you know what are the goals are right mm. when they like how do they in. find you like are you website yeah. you I mean, websites online word of mouth social media google you know and and we try to of course expand uh or reach you know that's our goal yeah you know but like i think word of mouth i think is like probably a big part of it i think right okay um the how main many, thing like, is hmm? I was like, go ahead, go ahead. sorry go ahead oh no i was gonna say like how many like leads do you think you get per month like how many do you guys track it or do you like how many yeah do you think, like... I mean, 
maybe like um close to 30 i guess about 30 minutes? okay okay you know um and these are people know, that like find you on google or like they see yeah. you on facebook or something you like know that. It, like that you okay. know and then our of course you know we have people that might be um referrals and things like that as well um yeah you know we try to the thing is like what i think like about the leads is like what is a lead right it can be a lead that's not can be a, a strong lead you know mm -hmm. um you can get leads i used to have so many leads a, a month but 10 percent of them were good so if you have yeah that's that's generally kind of like that's generally like in all you know, in all businesses we have, I have another business too like all so businesses the I'm main thing is having a good lead right if you have 30 good leads that's a good number now yeah. if you have 100 leads and 10 percent of them are good now you have 10 you know so yeah it all depends what kind of leader you're getting from so i used to do facebook um marketing in oh nice majority, huh i said that's yeah i do the same thing okay and then it's like the majority of the leads are not that great yeah honestly, yeah honestly, the truth um so it's like so you have to narrow down what 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 i mean numbers are good the quantity is probably what you're looking for as yeah. far as and it's like always like the chicken or the egg right like you can get you know a lot of leads but then you have no leads and then like some of them are good but so you know what i mean like the local version like, in the reality yeah? for me it's just just about opportunity you know what i'm saying like let yeah. me get as much opportunity as i can i have some people that are like you know oh i thought this like i've had people that if you looked at them you would be like this is not going to work for this person and then they sign up and you're like oh my god like i'm so glad this worked for you you know but i would never have known if i didn't if I yeah didn't that's the beautiful thing about like jujitsu i think like it's like um you cannot judge any book by the cover you know yeah yeah i mean i was joking with my students like telling them like um i think the most beautiful thing about jujitsu in my opinion you can get somebody that's completely non-athletic and mm. they can be a genius in on a mat right yeah, I mean, Mike, Mike Musumashi is not no. saying that he's the most athletic person. He's, I think he's he pretty athletic. athletic. I think he likes to say that, but I think that guy's pretty athletic. I think he is athletic, but small, like, but okay. Yeah. So if you look at him with the clothes on, are you going to judge him as athletic person? Yeah, not at all. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So he that his athleticism developed over time with jujitsu. Yeah, right. He does. I think have, he's mastered the way to be. To be very technical i think he is like he's, he's more like a brainiac yeah he's a brainiac and he knows how to study jujitsu and how, how to practice properly and effectively yeah. and that's I got my back from from kyle from kyle Terra, mm -hmm. and he was there for a while mikey was there and those guys together were like the brainiac yeah kind of guys like it's very it's very very interesting i was thinking that in jujitsu a majority of the lighter guys you know mike's a little bit off the charts but majority of the guys when they're small they're, you're not ever gonna see a guy that's small frame mm -hmm. that's an ignorant or not smart in jiu-jitsu in my opinion yeah you have no choice i mean you, know, I, you have to figure like, things out you, you can go against big guys all the time so you have to put your intellect in game right yeah you can't out muscle that's, your way yeah at 130 pounds i think my lightest i ever was when i was doing jiu-jitsu was like 138. you know what I'm yeah saying? i'm a little some weight now but like you're not gonna out my yeah huh how can i get out of this man yeah. yeah um what would you say so you get the new leads do you like call them do you have like a system that like i think calling in, like leads today i don't know if it's the most effective way to do it because mm. people are like they're not as comfortable they're not as eager to talk over the phone yeah people are busy now too, man. email huh yeah people are super busy now you know what i mean people yeah are so like, i think it's the best way probably email or text them just kind of text and email okay yeah i think probably um, that's way you do it okay what what would you say what's like the worst part would you say about trying to get like new students what is like the part that you don't like the most i mean i, I just the one part that i that and that i'm not a big fan is when um and you invest on someone you know to get mm -hmm. in here and you want to show how passionate you are about the sport and they don't they're not grasp yet right so mm -hmm. for me that's the the per, the part that i not a biggest fan yeah. when you pour into the student you know you got them here and you pour into the student and they see not they still not have the concept yet 
I mean, this is just a concept overall that I think like a lot of people have this misconcept. It's a misconcept just because you just for me is like a life hack, you know? Yeah. So a lot of the times people think that everything comes easy. Nothing in life comes easy that's worth it, you know? <laughs> so they have this. Yeah, I blame like, social media yeah. for that. It is not, yeah. yeah. Come on, man. They come in, they're like, oh, man, I'm going to learn jujitsu. They come for a week or two, then three, and they thought to master or know at that point jujitsu, yeah. right? So that's a misconception. Then he realized, man, this is, it is a tough sport. Yeah. So, and that then he's like, they don't realize the consistency is a big part of the game, right? I mean, anything. Do, do you play any instruments? I play a little bit of guitar. Oh really? Okay. I mean, not, I, play piano. Not any, I don't play anything anymore, but I, I try. I attempt to. Yeah, but I'm sure when you're learning guitar, like it's da 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 da. Yeah. Right. You get over and over and over until it's you learn the chords right? and this and that. You know, it's the same. Yeah. It, really, anything. You're gonna be a doctor. You, yeah. you have to be consistent. Like that's exactly. how inconsistently works, man. Um, yeah. No, I, that can be super frustrating. I think like trying to set expectations. I found like trying to set expectations. I'm like this is gonna take a while, bro. Like this isn't gonna happen overnight, brother. But you just gotta like you can't you can't get the work if you're not putting in the work. You know what I'm saying? You can't get yeah. the result if you're not putting in the work, man. Um, so going from like being an athlete, competing all the time, putting in the grind, putting in the work, to like academy owner, um, what do you think that impact has had on you? Like personally, like as you're growing. I mean, I mean I'll I'll be honest. Like there is a levels of competition. And mm -hmm. I believe that's like um, entails a lot of things, and you're gonna reflect a lot of the gym owners as well. Some of them do a transition, mm -hmm. transition well. Some not so much. Mm -hmm. but I think there's level of competition. You know? Like a person that's a world champion, as a go get it, mm -hmm. like a grinder, obsess. They have a harder time transition than somebody that just competed, for example, for local tournaments and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Everything there's levels, you know what I'm saying? You, know, you can look at it, the guys the highest level and um and um you know any sport that transition between them no, it become almost like a retirement, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to a retirement period, if people really struggle with that because for you to become that guy, for example, oh I'm so and so now you know I'm not in that level yeah. anymore, and then you're like, Okay, I have to do the, the the coaching a lot of people some some transition really well yeah I think how, has that been for you? Hmm? how has that transition been for you you think i mean there's there's a lot there's uh times you know that i felt like i was doing the, the good job then you realize that you still have a lot of work to do you know mm. that's the thing about being a coach is like you have always i mean like anything you always have um place to improve right so i'm trying to improve every day you know because i think like that the the school owner and the coach is more than is getting more demanding you know so i think you have to serve more yeah do I, you, are you is it just you by yourself or do you have people helping out or? No, i have a lot of people there oh, i have good, a good. phenomenal staff i'm really oh, glad good, good. My staff. shout out to the staff that's so huge i talked to people yeah. like i mean i have a lot i'm really blessed. Out, try to do it all yourself i'm really man. blessed yes yeah i'm extremely blessed with the staff but um you know but as a coach you know like it is like I, I mean, you know, it comes to a to a teaching plan, right? Because I mean, jujitsu is not like before. You know, I think a lot of people do the curriculum. I think that's cool, but people they come in and they know jujitsu, they want to learn more, right? They don't want to learn that ABC. Yeah, yeah. Right? They want to go further than that. Again, I blame the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the guys watching the DVD and they're like, "Hey, man, what do you think about this? I watching this or did this." So I seen all the time, and I actually I like to see my students seeking for knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. they like trying to find different sources of knowledge, and I can I like that because that's just level increase the level of the technique that you're gonna go through. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, you have to cater not only for the fundamentals and like really basic ABC, but mm -hmm. you have to like level up your game. So you're constantly studying jujitsu watching yeah. matches you know mm -hmm. to make sure you you are you know yeah it's so interesting you say that because like you know my approach has always been and even actually it's gone from i'm gonna tell you all the fancy stuff to like look dude let's just let's get you here you know what i mean yeah. like my my wife's friend's husband 
is a basketball trainer in LA, right? So he works with these high school kids and people that are trying to go to college and stuff. And it's, I feel like it's the same in a sport. Like these guys yeah. want to do this stuff, but look, if you can't dribble the ball on both hands, like yeah, you're not going to be able right. to do that, bro. Like yeah. it just won't work. And then once you have put that in, like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's find out what's working. There is this study that came out. Um, I just found out this yesterday. There was a study that came out, I think it was in 2012. And what they did was they showed all the moves from that world's and uh, whoever did the like what was the best move like what was the most effective pass what was the most effective submission yeah who was pulling a guard what what percentage won and this it was really like data like oh my god this because we can think oh I, I thought I saw this and it looked like that but like when you see the numbers out like oh this is what it is right and I looked this up yesterday and apparently there's a lot of them now and it's like okay, these are the techniques that are working. Like there was one interesting thing that showed like at championship superstar level, if you get the back position and you get four points in this event, you had a hundred percent chance of winning. Like yeah, everyone that got the back, say. what was that? IBJJF, I would say, right? Yeah, I, I think it was like one of them. I forgot. It was some big tournament. I think it may have been the Worlds or uh, yeah, I like think Abu Dhabi or something. I mean, uh, I, yes, I yeah. I'll find out and I'll send it to you. I'll find out exactly what I'm talking about and I'll send it okay. to you. But, but then you have I a direction of like, this is what we're going to teach, guys. Like, this is what works. Let's go here. If there's some fancy stuff for this, just for me, first as a coach, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. I think that's really important. But I think, like, I always start with the basic. And you get scale up to the, the more advanced, right? Yeah. I, I mean, always want to go over the fundamentals. Yeah, just like music. Even to right? the advanced guys, huh? Yeah, just like music, like one of the things they have in uh, like Western music, right? Like, you know, Beethoven and stuff. Is there, there's a whole thing that you need to be able to accomplish in a certain time before you can go to this next level. Like you have to play da 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 right? And there's like 60 of them. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to go to the next level music class. And I think like in dealing with something that's like with athleticism and sports and like different people's level of commitment, different people's like level of, uh, you know, ability. I think it makes it a little hard, you know, and that makes it yeah. like real subjective to like kind of the belt promotion system of, Hey, you know, you're getting beaten up every day by the new guy that comes in, but you're here every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, you're not really, you're getting a little bit better, but like you started at a real deficiency. Do you deserve a blue belt? You know what I mean? Like, do you deserve the work kind of thing? But like, um, but I think like that's yeah. kind of, that's a good point that you made it there. I mean, I think that the belt, you know, is very to people, right? Like, for example, yeah. you get a guy that's new, but he's a wrestler. Yeah. And he wrestling his whole life, and he's going to go against a white belt that's been trained for a year. And this guy is not, the, like, he's an older guy. He never done any jiu-jitsu before. He has no background. Mm. If this guy is younger, more likely he's going to beat him, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it varies. I used used to judge people by, oh, can you beat this guy? But not anymore. I, f I think that not not everybody's gonna grasp and learn the same way. Yeah. Everybody's gonna different technique, and everybody has a different background. Everybody has a different goal. Everybody that has a different life. So it's kind of really tough for you. I mean, that's why I don't like standard. Because let's stand this way: the guy that's training with me for a year. He won a couple of local tournaments. Now he wants to go to Worlds. Should mm. I promote that guy? No. Mm, yeah. You know, so it's really tough to have a standard and yeah. make it for everybody. Yeah. Because it, it, it changed. It's, it's really, there's a lot of variables. Yeah, I, I struggle so, with this too. Uh, we had a guy here the other day, and this is the first time we kind of did it. We did like a, an adult kind of belt promotion, kind of testing ceremony kind of thing um and i was just like let me just see what you could do and i mean he just really struggled just doing an arm bar from the guard i was like oh let's let's work on this like i blame myself that's my fault man if you're yeah. if you can't do this like wanna you know like let's let's take a step back but are you gonna tap out the new 20 year old wrestler guy that I just got done from college like maybe not you know what maybe i'm saying not. but like yeah. i can get you to this though we can get you to this you can be able to do this kind of thing that's kind of how i look at it um Okay, so let me ask you this. Like, in your been doing this a long time, like, 
would you say there was like a particular like roadblock or something that you really, really struggled with in your career as a martial arts gym owner that you were able to overcome? And like, what, what did that look like and how, and how were you able to do it? Like, what was the, what was the, like the moment in your gym was like, oh, this is really a difficult, how do I kind of, how do you get past it? I think like, um, personally, it's like, oh, you realize that you don't lo work for yourself, right? Mm. I don't think as a gym owner, you work for yourself, you work for everybody. Mm, okay. Ooh, okay. And that was like stopping you from like that concept? I mean, like I just think that like a lot of the times people think I'm a gym owner. I mean, you have the type of um, maybe, I don't say authority, but you think like things are supposed to be worked that was way. And then mm -hmm. sometimes it's not going to work that way because you have to, to please your customer, right? So your customer mm -hmm. is your boss. So yeah. you have several bosses. Yeah, you know, and you know, of course, there are certain Yelp, things that Yelp becomes are necessary your boss to the well-being of the school, right? Like, for example, all right, you have to wear clean, clean geese and you have to wear this gi because in high, for hygiene purpose, this is how is the best for the gym. Then yeah. explain that it's for the well-being of the gym itself, the health of the gym. So mm -hmm. it's not about like, oh, Samuel, I think this is cool. So it's mm -hmm. not about that, you know. And that's like um point that you realize that is like you are just a small part of it a small yeah. fraction of it right was there was there a time or like something that happened that made you kind of like start to realize that like is there any story you can say man i was doing this and then this happened and i was and this is how we had to I do mean, it's like um i mean i was trying to i mean it was just a, in my opinion i learned a lot right i mean you're here you know as a martial arts learn every day you know a lot mm -hmm. on and off the mats mm -hmm. and it's like Sometimes you look at gym, it's like, man, they look so cool, right? So you want to kind of get the model, you know? Mm -hmm. But the model won't work if you don't have people that on board and there's a reason behind. You're, we're really a reasonable, you know, as a human being. You just like say ABC as ABC because it's ABC. No, there's a, why yeah. is ABC, you know? There's yeah. everybody's in a question, right? We question our existence ourselves, right? So mm -hmm. people will question why things are this way so you have to have to have a valid explanation for mm. things you do in the gym. Okay. so you have to make sense you are in order to have that acceptance right because i mean you basically you're serving people you know yeah so you wanted to make sure that the, the things were implemented the things are done at the gym is for well-being of the community and the, the, the students right yeah uh, and that's for me um realizing that i think it was like a, a, it's a big part of it right it's yeah big part of like um of um being a school owner yeah and especially again like when you you know come from like being an athlete and you come from doing it all for yourself by yourself yeah and then you have to say wait a minute you know there's a this is a different different era this is a different life yeah. living now so like let's put the more focus uh on these guys and, and being able to communicate about like yeah. why we're we doing it guys this is this is the direction we're going and this is why we're doing it and exactly. i need you guys to get on board okay that, make, that makes sense um okay so big picture in a perfect world like where do you see your academy going like in a perfect world like how many students do you want how much money are you trying to make like what is your what is your like perfect world gym look like in the future like, I what think are you like, looking right now i mean i used to see numbers and numbers of course you have to pay the bills that's one reason that you look at numbers because it's a logical way to to see uh, how you're gonna provide for your family, how you're gonna be, you know, living a comfortable lifestyle yeah. and so forth. But I think like um, my goal now is having a gym when people are here, they're smiling, have a good time. Mm. You know, when you have that, when I achieve that level of comfort among the students, they feel extremely excited. They feel mm. extremely thrilled to be here. Mm -hmm. that's what i see myself it doesn't matter if you have 10 students in your mats and they see that they have that 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 sense of man i love to be here yeah I'm having fun i cannot wait to come back then the school is organically is going to grow yeah yeah you know having all those now let's pretend that you do the hit a really good marketing you know tool and you pack in your gym mm -hmm. all right if you're not delivering a good product and where they're happy 
but people having a good time, they're laughing, having a blast on a mat. Yeah. That's not going to be sustainable. Yeah. Um, so sustainability, sustainability probably that's our goal, right? My goal is to provide uh, a great product. People are pleased with what we teach, you know, mm -hmm. and to have an environment that's a healthy environment. And yeah. that's our goal. Okay. I mean, I think, like you said, it sounds like you're just, you know, leading with intention and saying like, yeah. Hey, look, if I can keep this going, grow, like, you know, I have another business. We do like home care and it can grow a lot, but like you, the quality goes down then you have to grow and get more people and like to keep it kind of a, it's never going to be like this, but if the intention is like, look, quality is above all else. You know what I'm saying? Quality is above kind of everything. It's, it's going to be hard for everybody to fall in love with you. Guys, right. That's the yeah. thing. But if you have the people, your core, the people that stay in there, they're mm -hmm. happy they're having a good time yeah and they're you delivering that product they're they're looking for mm -hmm. and of course we want to reach more people of course to increase the numbers but you know have the the overall satisfaction in your product i think like it is important and yeah. that's um our goal i mean you know of course it's like that's what we're trying to achieve every day yeah you know and it's like that's why like my even at the bell system the way, way i thought my thought process was, and it is right now, is a completely different because my our goal is to enhance people's lives. Yeah. So I cannot try to have the same standard for everybody. Mm -hmm. If I have like, okay, before I was like, man, I want everybody to be Samuel Braga. Nobody is going to be like Samuel Braga. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's an unrealistic um, goal. So yeah. nowadays, our goal or vision is to have a place where people can come out and say, man, I had a great workout, I had a great mm -hmm. time. I'm getting better shape, I'm confident, I feel great, and I cannot wait to come back. Man, that is beautiful, bro. Okay, last question. Uh, what would you say, what advice would you give to someone that may be considering opening up a gym? Be passionate. You have to be passionate what you do. Mm -hmm. You like, you know, people have different intentions, the most important tension, like for example, I don't see this as a job, right? I can I come here 5 a.m., 5 30 a.m. Mm. I teach a class, I'm really, really excited. I have the same energy as 5 a.m. at mm. 11 a.m. Mm. And you know, then I have 4 30. I mean, I have sometimes 10 a.m. classes mm. and I have class back to back. You have the same level of passion, mm. what you do throughout the day, and you're gonna do over and over again, mm. you know, and you cannot be tired right yeah you want to have the excitement you shouldn't have to see in you that you love what you do you're excited and you are happy what you do so yeah. if you're doing for different reasons right oh man i want to make that money i want to do this i want to do this. so in in are you going to be able to do that sustainable for how long yeah right? yeah i've been doing this for a long period of time of course yeah. I've changed, uh over t over the years and i I mean no but um ideally i love what i do yeah, you know? well, yeah. i'm trying you can to tell like i can you can tell through. man you can tell like yeah. when someone loves it he's like dude this guy is he's about it you know what i'm saying so, yeah okay well thank you so much samuel uh this has been great bro i think like people will hopefully will see this and give them some like insight into what it's like being an academy owner you know maybe people that came from brazil understand the path to be able to get to where you are uh from you know being in brazil to coming here being a competitor having a gym and just living with like yeah, just people, and stuff. yes exactly i mean you know? Darryl, i read this book you know for somebody that's come from brazil or, what's it um, called uh, i forgot the name of the book but i know the concept general concept because I, it made me understand a lot of things right hmm. there's four facets of a business all right you have hmm. the technician that you hmm. get the work done yourself hmm. and you have the e manager huh was it the book the e-myth revisited the e i don't work. know so it sounds very simple yes yes then you Go have ahead. the manager you have the entrepreneur you have four facets of you you want to make sure that you know them for but you don't do them for yeah. in a certain way yeah. right you have to in my opinion you have to have people you can do it all of course you can have to wear the, all the hats at some point mm. but you have to have people that you can rely on each part of it so you're not doing it at all you're not overextend yeah. yourself i have mm. a lot of amazing people I've surrounded a lot of amazing people there helping with the organization with the clean 
mm-hmm. clean the gym. We have people that help me in, in this aspect with the kids, with adults. So I have people that, you know, have a great few group of people around you that mm-hmm. loves what they do and they feel that it's special, really important. I think yeah. when you come from Brazil as a competitor and you think that you are the sender of everything and it is not necessarily the truth, you know, yeah. that translate, they will not translate for a gym uh, to be successful, right? Yeah, that's deep, man. Well, Samuel, brother, muito obrigado. Thank you so not much, bro. Uh, we're, this has been episode three of the BJJ oh, so Business and Marketing Podcast so with Samuel Braga in Knoxville, Tennessee. If y'all see this, get a chance, stop by, say what's up. Um, and awesome. We'll see you on the next episode. So hang out real quick, Samuel. Uh, yes. We're just going to turn this thing off here. Um...